The topic of my sermon this morning is Welcome My Friend, the Holy Spirit. And I entitled it Welcome My Friend, the Holy Spirit because although there will be some academia involved in this sermon, there will be some um, line upon line, verse upon verse, theological, doctrinal context about the Holy Spirit. What I want you to focus on more than anything else is that he wants to be your friend. The personal, not uh, overly doctrinal, overly theological awesomeness of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit who, yes, dwells in the presence of God and yet walks with me on a daily basis. And I'm going to start with two questions. We cannot, we cannot engage this conversation about the Holy Spirit without first personally ans- asking ourselves and answering these two questions. First, do you believe that the Bible is the inspired Word of God? Jesus made flesh. We could quote many other verses, some from Timothy, profitable for correction, reproof, and training in righteousness. Do we believe that? Or do we pick and choose what fits our personal theology? Do we just pick and choose what we want to believe, what we want to obey, what we want to walk in, and then we discard the rest as not for today, not for us? Because if you look at the Bible in historical context from Revelations, uh, from, let's start with Genesis, from Genesis to Revelation, although you could start backwards and go forward because it would be all the same, if we look tucked away in Hebrews, almost at the end, it says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's right above you. If we believe this, then if Jesus is the Word, then the Word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Which means I either believe it or I don't. And that is a question that you have to ask yourself with some level of intensity. Because my observation in my own life and my observation in the lives of those I walk with is that we believe it in part and we live it in part, but when the oceans roar, we get afraid. And when we should be strong and courageous, we are fearful and we hide. And when the enemy lies to us, when our flesh lies to us, we so readily believe that, yet we so quickly reject the truth of the word of God. And it has kept us living beneath our privileges as children of God. Because as children of God, he calls us to nest with eagles. Isaiah tells us that. For I will mount up with wings as eagles. I will run and not be weary. I will walk and not faint. Anybody weary here? then you're not rising up. Whatever is happening, whatever the disconnect, you are living beneath what God has called for, ordained for, hoped for, promised you, and has sacrificed for you to live. The second question is a little bit like the first but it brings it down to our own, a little more to our own personal life. And it's, do you believe and therefore live standing on the word and recognizing that it is true and for you today? Because let me explain something to you. When things don't work out the way we plan, it's really easy to say, well, that was Jesus and Paul. That was, that was Abraham. That was Moses. That 
you know, and somehow we almost deify those people and we forget that Moses was so frustrated that he deliberately disobeyed God and struck the rock when God told him to speak to it. We, we tuck that away and we use it occasionally, but how many times have you, you don't have to raise your hand, but it might be good if you did, because James tells us if we confess our sins one before another, we'll be healed. So he, since healing is the room, maybe we should consider that. How many of you have ever known what God wanted you to do and deliberately disobeyed it? Did you reap consequences? Yeah, you did. Is the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God still with you in your consequences? 100%. Just because you were disobedient and just because you, out of some prideful human arrogance, thought you knew better than the inerrant word of God and decided to go your own way does not mean that the rest of the Bible is thrown out and not true either. Because he says he loves you and that stands. And if you, if you make a mistake, if you, God tells you to do something and you do something else and you find yourself in the middle of consequences with oceans roaring, it's really easy then to believe the second lie, which is that he doesn't love you. And then once you believe two lies, then it's easier to believe three. And before you know it, you find yourself slowly sinking further and further and further below the nesting place where God has called you to dwell. This wasn't part of my sermon, but I'm just going to do it anyway. Eagles have two sets of eyelids. You know why? Because they fly so close to the sun that if they did not have an inner set of eyelids to protect their eyes, they would burn out their retinas. Can I tell you something, church? My personal prayer this year is that I fly with my eyes half closed all year. I want to fly with my eyes half closed all year so that my retinas don't burn out. Because I can pray for miracles and I can expect miracles, but until I live like I am a resource for Jesus to use to perform miracles, I'm never going to see them. And the only way I can live like that clear channel, like that clear, unadulterated resource is for me to fly high and nest high. And believe what is true and what, not, and what is not fabricated by society, politics, opinions. What, I don't care. You know, honestly, I, it's not that I don't care because I don't have compassion. I have deep compassion. But I don't care what's going on in the world because God is in charge. God is in charge. So build the wall, don't build the wall. I don't care. I don't care. God is in charge. And my only responsibility as his child is to be available when he tells me to move. That's it. I want to give you just a little information about the Holy Spirit. First of all, he dwells in the presence of God all day. I had the occasion um, a, a couple Saturdays ago, ago because of, of a situation that drove me to be in the presence of God, really for art. I was praying for him. And I, I lost track of time, and I was probably just lost in the presence of God for about an hour and a half. He came in the room, and I, I realized that that much time had passed. And I, I can't tell you how I felt after that. 
I, I can't tell you what the rest of my day was like because of that. So if we would spend that time in the presence of God, we would notice a, a visible, physical difference in our, in our person. Number two, the Holy Spirit responds only to the Father's bidding. He does nothing on his own. He's sounding more like a good mentor every day, isn't he? Every sentence I say. He does nothing on his own. He only does what the Father tells him. Secondly, he is a person. Albeit spirit, he is not an it. Therefore, since he is not an it, he is not inanimate, he is a person, you can have a relationship with him. A full-on conversational relationship with the Holy Spirit. Fourth thing <clears throat> is that he can distinguish between the holy and the profane. I don't, I don't exactly know everything that is profane before God, but I know this, I, I really don't want to participate in anything that would be profane. And it's not so much what we do that can become profane, because I think most of us uh, have a desire to serve God, so we, you know, we want to serve God, we want to do what's right, we, we want to move forward with that, but sometimes it's not what we do, but why we do it. So if I help the widow next door because I've heard she's got $50,000 buried under her floor and I'm going to clean for her until I find it, can you understand how that would be less of an altruistic motive than if I just cleaned for her because I loved her? So what happens is <clears throat> once we start entering into this relationship with God and this relationship with the Holy Spirit, it it becomes what we do. Yes, it's always going to be about what we do and the choices we make. But the finer sieve is why we do things. What is our motivation? When it says God judges the heart, I believe that this is one of the ways God judges the heart. He judges why we do things which is why we don't carry his brand of justice because we only see what someone does and we never fully understand their motivation. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. <clears throat> I listed four ways that the Holy Spirit can be grieved and we're going to look at some scriptures. The first way he can be grieved is by despising his gifts. That means we don't take seriously the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We don't recognize them. We don't honor their operation. And maybe, maybe, that we don't even openly seek them on a regular basis. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19-21 says this. Wow, even glasses are... are. <laughs> what happens when you get old in your glasses? But what then? Large print, right? That's what happens. Okay. I don't know where Michelle is, but you might want to order one of those large print Bibles. For you. First Thessalonians 5.19 says, Do not, do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good and stay away from every kind of evil. Do not stifle the Holy Spirit. I am really grateful that we don't have a clock for worship in our church. That, that, I'm, that's enough said. Yeah, that's, there's no explanation needed. <clears throat> the other way the Holy Spirit can be grieved is neglecting the gift that we have been given. Now this gets a little tricky because here's where the lies come in. 
if you don't understand that you are gifted, and if you don't understand that you've been given a gift, then it might be easy for you to neglect it. It could also be easy for you to be prideful and use it for your own advancement. Both of those, both of those scenarios would be neglecting the gift that you've been given. 1 Timothy 4.14 says this. Do not neglect the spiritual gift you received through the prophecy spoken over you when the elders of the church laid their hands on you. Give your complete attention to these matters. Throw yourself into your tasks so that everyone will see your progress. Keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the salvation of those who hear you. How close of a watch are you keeping on your own life? Can others encounter you on a weekly basis and see that you've grown? They should. That, that should be, it should be measurable. See Shutting down our emotions and not expressing them. Ephesians. Let's turn to Ephesians 5. Verses 18 through 19. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. Give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you have ever seen somebody with just about too, too many drinks? Pretty happy, aren't they? Pretty happy, pretty free, pretty free with the laughter, pretty free with the verbiage, pretty free. And then translate that same person into a church service where the Holy Spirit is falling and they're like this. No, do not be drunk with wine. Instead, instead indicates that the Holy Spirit is a substitute for your drunken partying. If you can stand up tonight at 5.30 and cheer your brains out when the saints beat the eagles or the eagles beat the saints, then I'm going to chastise you. Why are you not spinning around in church when the Holy Spirit moves? I'm not talking blatant, unrestrained, crazy displays of emotion that are just that. Remember, I was born into the charismatic movement. I, I know emotion. I know swinging from the chandeliers and acting like a crazy nut. God never acts asks you to act that's a hard thing to say God never asks you to act like a crazy nut but he does command your body's response when the Holy Spirit wells up within you I would I, I am mortified if I'm ever even tempted to not have an emotional reaction, response, and relationship to my God. Because it cannot be all intellectual. It cannot be all head knowledge. Because that's just the Pharisees. That's just Pharisaical. 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 I knew it was there someplace. God 
help us if we ever become Pharisees where the word of God is concerned. So when the Holy Spirit rises up, let me give you a little hint. You know it. You know it and you stifle it or you release it. Don't ever be ashamed. God is not ashamed of you. God is not ashamed of you. And if you can go act like a nut at a football game or go out, have some drinks with your friends and act like a nut, you better be able to act like a holy nut in here. The last way that the Holy Spirit can be grieved is when we resist his fruit in our lives. I, I can't, I've said, I don't know how many times I've said this here. I'll say it till I'm dead. The fruits of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit are not nouns. They are verbs. They are things you do. They are not things you acquire. Like, oh, I went to an antique store the other day and I got a nice little shelf to put my fish on and our communion stuff in our little prayer room. No, you can't acquire patience. You do patience. And you know how you do patience? Look to your right, look to your left. I'll look straight ahead. That's how we do patience. By dealing with irritating people. How do you do self-control? Look to your left, look to your left. How do you learn self-control? By having situations where being out of control would be appropriate. You want a life in Christ that's like a bed of roses? Then develop the fruit and stop grieving the Holy Spirit. Because he gives you opportunity after opportunity after opportunity for you to develop the fruit of the Spirit in your life and you resist him at every turn because you are self-willed and we are, we are arrogant and prideful and think we know better. Somehow we think we have a right to tell someone off. Honestly, I can think of about 15, 20 reasons why you would have a right to tell someone off. But here's a, little, here's a little secret in the kingdom. Not everything that could be said needs to be said. And of all the things that need to be said, very few of them need to be said by you. You just, just, just get a great opportunity to tell somebody off and don't do it. And see what happens. You talk, you talk about atmospheric change, you're going to get atmospheric change because they're not going to know what to do. Long-suffering? Oh, we'll just go right on to the next point. Please don't grieve the Holy Spirit in 2019. The Holy Spirit is evangelistic. Oh, no, I'm sorry. He's the source of gifts and power. I want to talk about that first. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11. Let's just read them. They're good. It's the word. Verse 7 through 11. Okay, it says, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. It's not so I can pat my bat self on the back and tell you what the Lord has done in me or for me or through me. It is so that I can help you. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. That's called word of wisdom. To another, the same spirit gives a message of special knowledge. That's also called the word of knowledge. 
The same Spirit gives great faith to another, to someone else. The one Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. And still another person is given the ability to speak in an unknown language. While another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. Let me explain to you that the, it, during every Sunday morning service, whoever's on the pulpit had better be asking the Lord for the spirit of discernment, the gift of discernment from the Holy Spirit. Why? Because we get prophetic words up here all the time. And some of them are prophetic words. Some of them are great insights of human flesh. And somebody has to know the difference. Someone has to know the difference so that the words of the Lord are given and words that are either not for that moment or perhaps are not of the Lord or not for that season, they're held back. You know why that, that is? For protection. Because the word says that the prophecy is subject to the prophet. Which means, I can hear one word from the Lord and build a whole paragraph out of it. The one word needs to be spoken, the paragraph needs to be left unsaid. Right? Right? Miracles, healing, we need those things in the church. And the Holy Spirit gives them to us. so that we can help one another. If my faith is, is weak in an area, I want someone to stand beside me that has faith that will build me up and prop me up. Which is why any time, any given moment of any given day, when you feel like you're better alone, then you are in a group you're being lied to. Because God never says, oh, I give you all these gifts so you can go on an island and be all by yourself because you're good. Whatever you need, you got. No, he said the Spirit decides who to give the gifts to so we can help one another. He also gives us power. Power, Acts 1.8, It says simply, I can probably quote it, but I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to read it. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Power. The word for power here is dunamis. And it, it, it's the, the English word for that is dynamite. It's the explosive power of dynamite. And when you receive the Holy Spirit, that's what you receive. You receive a power that is explosive like dynamite, which means it can erupt at any moment. You know how unstable dynamite is? It's really unstable. What does that mean? You have to be ready. You have to be ready. You have to be lived up. You have to be prayed up. You have to be in the spirit. You have to be ready because at any moment the spirit could say, you know what? Now, go lay your hands on that person and, and heal them. You're not healing them. I hope you all know that. Jesus is healing them. You are just a vessel through which the Holy Spirit has chosen Jesus' power to flow through. It has nothing to do with you. Which is why the lies of being unworthy are totally big, unadulterated lies. Because it's not about you. I've known people who were barely walking with Jesus, but because they were willing, the Holy Spirit flowed through them. Right? 
Some people aren't even couth. Smith Wigglesworth, great man of God, he picked up a guy, threw him into a wall. Probably could have done with a little self-control, maybe. I'm not sure. I'm not going to judge the man. But he did, he did with the power that the Holy Spirit gave him, and miracles happened. I don't want to tell people about Jesus anymore. Because we, as an American society, are saturated with the word Jesus. He's everywhere. He's a swear word. Uh, little kids use him. They just, people just use the word of Jesus carte blanche when they're excited. Oh, Jesus. No, I'm tired of that. I want a pointed approach to people seeing the power of God and recognizing the man behind the name. Jesus is also evangelistic. You can look it up in your own, Acts 4.31. He, gives, he causes us to be bold witnesses, which means we're not afraid, we're not ashamed to talk about Jesus. I was in a situation uh, this week where I, I was kind of, I mean, I, like, I'm, I, I don't know. I mean, this has been my life for 50 some odd years. So I just talk about Jesus wherever I am. And all of a sudden, I realized by the looks in the face that talking about Jesus and the way I was talking to him was probably not the most appropriate conversation for the moment, especially after I said, you know, I... I prayed and God gave me milk and I breastfed two of my adopted children. And people were just like, Whoa. So I thought, okay, Sharon, we better ask for a little discernment here. Tone it down a little. You know, talk about football for just a few minutes. <laughs> Let them get their bearings and then we'll go back. Okay? Now, the next uh, three slides I just want you to look at really quick because if we are going to, if we're going to flow in the Holy Spirit this year, that's engage, right? What I've just summarized for you is engaging the Holy Spirit. So if you engage and you don't, and you rest with the fulcrum being obedience, we will see amazing things that God will do through us this year. However, next slide, if we engage and we throw rest off the teeter-totter, we're going to sink just like this teeter-totter. And the reverse is if we rest and rest. You know what, Lord? Yep, I'm going to go pray for that person just one more day. Yeah, just, this is my Sabbath. This is my Sabbath. Engage will go right off and we'll never do anything. So we're going to have to keep a very gentle balance. And I want you to look at the fulcrum as I close. The fulcrum is obedience. And here's how I want you to obey. Here's how I want me to obey. Because you have to understand that when, when I preach, and I think I can say for anyone else who preaches up here, we have maybe one finger pointed this way, but the rest of our fingers are pointing here. So I'm challenging myself in the same way. I want you to begin believing that the Holy Spirit is really who the Bible says he is. I want you to believe it. I don't want you just to give intellectual assent to it, but I want you to believe it. Second, I want you to believe that he will actually do what the Bible says he will do. If the lame walk, then the lame should walk. If the blind see, the blind should see. Third, I want you to believe and I want you to know that he wants to and will flow through us.
He doesn't want to go to Brownsville again. And Smith Wigglesworth is already in heaven. So is Catherine Coleman. So are a bunch of other people. So guess who's left? Yeah, Chestnut Street Community Church in Roselle, New Jersey. We're left. I want you to cast away doubt, fear, pride, anything that would cause a resistance to the Holy Spirit. Unbelief. I think often of the, the man who brought his son to Jesus and Jesus asked him, do you believe? And he said, yes, I believe. Help my unbelief. And I've found myself in that position multiple times throughout my life. Lord, I believe. Oh, Jesus, help my unbelief because I believe. But then when he says, Sharon, will you, will you let me flow through you? It's like, gosh, there's so many more people qualified. There's so many other people. I'm sure that they're closer to you. I'm sure their lives are more, are more godly than mine. Just, no. He wants to, and he will, flow through us. If we cast away our doubt, our fear, our pride, our unbelief, anything that would stop us. I also want you to cultivate a relationship with him. I want you to talk to him. Just like you would talk to anybody else. I remember waking up one Sunday morning, ah, maybe 10 years ago. We were here, so within the last 16 years. I don't remember when it was. But I woke up and I said, Lord, what are we going to do today? Holy Spirit, what's up? What's on tap? And the Holy Spirit said to me, I want you to wear green to church today because we are going to go to war. And I thought to myself, did I eat anything strange before I went to bed? No, I didn't think that. You know why? Because I talk to the Holy Spirit all the time and I expect him to answer me. You better expect him to answer you too. So you know what I did? I got up and I wore green. You know, I only have about two green things in my whole wardrobe. I'm kind of a black and white and red girl, personally. But I had something green and I put it on and I want to tell you, we went to war that day. Because the Holy Spirit's not a liar. Next, I want you to learn to hear and know his voice. just about practice. You know, I can be anywhere in this building and I know when Pastor Art is coming. You know why? Because I know his footsteps. I know, I know how he plants his foot on the floor. You know why? Because I've spent 41 intimate years with this man. I can pick his voice out of a, out of a crowd of a thousand because I've spent 41 years listening and straining to hear him call me. Honestly and truly, I have heard him call me before the words came out of his mouth. I want you to have that kind of relationship with the Holy Spirit. I want you to hear him coming. I want you to hear him. And I want you to be there before he even calls. Next, I want you to develop a confidence in God's willingness to use you. I've already told you my stories about trying to raise the guy from the dead. I knew I heard God's voice. That guy's still in the ground. But you know what? I was obedient. I don't know what that was about. But here's the cool thing. I don't really have to know what that was about. Because my only response to the Father is obedience. I don't have to care if I look foolish. I don't have to care what you think of me. I love you all very much, but I really don't care what you think of me. Because compared to your approval versus God's approval, 
I will choose God every time. And that's no disrespect to any of you whatsoever. I love you and I will serve you and I will try to make you happy. But guess what I found out? I can't make you happy all the time. I will disappoint you. I will hurt you. I will fail you. So my only response is to be obedient to the Lord to the best of my ability and go to bed at night and say, good job, Sharon. And to repent if I screw up. Lastly, I want you to know that it will always be Jesus and it will never be you who holds the power. The Holy Spirit has moved throughout history in, in, in waves of uh, waning or increasing power. And every move of God up to this point, some flesh has gotten into it. Somebody, you know, build a tent, somebody, wh whatever they did, you know, wh whatever they did to, to call attention to themselves, or they, they get, I don't know what they get, but then they sin. You know what I'm saying? Every move of God throughout history has gotten waylaid by some, some expression of the flesh. Here's what I, here's my prayer. This, this is my prayer for us this year. It has been my prayer since January 1st. Is that we will be a congregation who will allow Jesus to flow through us in any manner he chooses and that we will never touch it, ever. And when it flows, we will be obedient vessels. And if he stops, we will still be obedient, obedient vessels and we don't make stuff up. So that we pretend that the Spirit is moving when he's not. That's my prayer for us as a congregation. If you will join me in that prayer, I'll be really happy. So today I'm just going to ask you, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Are you actively having a relationship with the Holy Spirit? It's real simple. Jesus says he sent him when he left so that we would have what's called a paraclete, one who's called alongside to help. He's our helper. He'll teach us all things. So if you do not have the Holy Spirit, I would like you just to come down front right over here and we're going to pray for you for you to open your heart to the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to just tell you real quick, this is how it works. This is how it works. It's really simple. When you, when you enter into a salvation relationship with Jesus, the Godhead cannot be separated. So you have all three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're all there. However, just like any guest who comes into your home, he's in the foyer. And he stays in the foyer until he's given permission to come in and sit down. And if you only give Jesus and the Holy Spirit permission to be in the living room, then that's where he's going to stay. But if you say to the Holy Spirit, you know what? Come, my home is your home. You can go in the basement. You can go in the attic. You can look in any closet. You can pull out any drawer. Anything about my life, anything about the, the, my heart, my home, you have access to. That's when the Holy Spirit comes in and fills you because he will fill your house. So if you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, it is simply yours for the asking. Now sometimes, all times, eventually, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you receive a prayer language. The prayer language is your first physical manifestation that you have been filled with or you have given the, the Holy Spirit permission, release, to be in your life. And when that happens, it's a language that you've never spoken. It's a heavenly language and it's a language that the enemy cannot intercept and it is different than the gift of the Spirit, which I talked to you about earlier, which was tongues and interpretation of tongues. 
It's just a prayer language that you use to edify yourself, to build yourself up, and to communicate with the Holy Spirit on, on a supernatural level. It's not scary, and if it doesn't happen, it doesn't, right this second, it doesn't mean God doesn't love you. It just means that you press in, and you pursue, and you build, until the relationship is such that you're comfortable enough letting the Holy Spirit speak through you. So if that's you, and you desire that, just stand up and come right over here. If you are filled with the Holy Spirit, but you haven't utilized it for a long time, then you're going to come and stand right over here. And we're going to uh, charge you up in the Holy Spirit. And we're going to pray for you that the Holy Spirit will overflow you in a way, in a fresh way. Because the Holy Spirit's oil is fresh every day. So if you're using yesterday's oil, you want to come and stand here. If you want filled with the Holy Spirit for the first time, you can come and stand there. You can move now.